Next, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Janos Martoni, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Hungary, who will deliver a keynote speech titled Flag and Trade in Transatlantic Relations. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to uh, have so many good people around, among them many good friends, and also distinguished guests. So uh, I'm looking forward to this uh, conference, which is very timely indeed. Now, let me just start with uh, a very brief uh, explanation of uh, uh, the uh, words, the meaning of the words which I used uh, in the title of uh, my remarks. Uh, the flag. The flag is in fact the gone. Uh, it's the warship. It's the navy. Uh, in a more general sense, it is the state. Uh, it is the sovereign state. It is the sovereign state's uh, security. It is the sovereign state's uh, military might. It is the sovereign state's uh, geopolitical uh, position and power. But that's more or less the flag. Now the trade, the trade uh, more concretely is the trader who is buying and selling. Sometimes he is buying opium and then sends warships if opium is not purchased. But normally, uh, of course, uh, the trader sells and buys. Uh, this is trade. This is international trade. In a more general sense, it is also economy. It is GDP, uh, whether purchasing power basis uh, or current prices basis or per capita basis. It is also um, the overall economic uh, dimension and trade, in a more general sense, dimension of the geopolitical situation and structure we have. Now, I didn't use the third word in my title, which is probably, to my mind, probably a little bit more important than the flag and the trade, but we talk much less about that. And um, in a symbolic way, I would say that this third word is the Bible. Of course, uh, in a more general sense, uh, these are in general the holy scriptures, like the Veda, like the Bible, like the Quran. Uh, so that is what on our mind. Uh, that is, in fact, uh, culture. In a, in a more general sense, this is also what we now call soft power. It's also a key factor of the uh, ongoing geopolitical game which we are now witnessing. Now, <clears throat> on the geopolit geopolitical structure, one or two words, briefly. There has been an ongoing debate for a while whether the word is, uh, is uh, bipolar, unipolar, multipolar. Uh, in a different wording, you have the uh, discussion about the G, uh, 7, G8, G20, now uh, many people say, no, no, it's just G2, maybe. Uh, some people say, no, 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 G this is G0. Uh, none has a dominant position, in fact. We have a real multiple structure. We do not even know exactly what the poles are and what do they represent uh, in flag trade and so on. But of course, uh, that's another debate. I don't want to get into that because I have got my own version uh, for the structure. My version for the structure, I took it from neuroscience, while we also use it a little bit uh, in the field of legal philosophy when we discuss about the geometry of legal norms. Now, my uh, version is uh, that the world, uh, uh, the geopolitical structure of the world is heterarchic, which means it's not hierarchic. It is heterarchic, which means um, that you have both vertical and horizontal elements. You have a var variety of elements. Maybe they are in a network, but that's an another theory which I don't want to get into this morning. 
But the main point is that the world is, uh, is indeed ranked. It's not true it's unranked. It is ranked, but it's ranked in a variable and a different uh, uh, way. I mean, that's why I call it a ranking, uh, I mean, a, a, a kind of um, changing ranking, which means that uh, the ranking itself changes, depending upon the subject. Population, China and India. GDP, United States, China, European Union, trade, European Union, largest exporter importer still in the world, military might, power, United States, Russia, nuclear warheads, Russia, United States. So <clears throat> it's a complex picture, and it means that uh, indeed the ranking is uh, uh, not just, uh, 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 let's say, uh, different, but also, also changing. Now, this is the problem, that the ranking is always changing, because there is a keen competition, a rivalry uh, in this uh, uh, structure, and also what makes the situation even more complex is the very special relationship between flag and trade. Uh, the conventional wisdom used to be that trade normally plays a moderating role upon the political conflicts. Not always. I don't want to get into that, but we have two world wars where the economic relations were fairly developed. And the idea that the economic, uh, 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 let's say, relationship or intertwining of the economies makes war more costly, it's true but people still uh, 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 made the war. But uh, now we are witnessing a strange phenomenon, and uh, this is, which I, I, I would come back to it in a, in a different context, that uh, in fact, uh, trade is used. In, in fact, the traditional uh, uh, instruments of trade, like tariffs, they are used for geopolitical purposes. They do not mitigate, they do not moderate, I mean, the trade policy measures, but just the other way around. Now, that's something, I believe, a little bit new. And, uh, of course, uh, that, uh, that gives uh, uh, the reason uh, why is happening, what is happening now in the, in the world uh, scene. Because uh, what we are witnessing now is clearly that uh, in demographic, economic, and military terms, the so-called uh, Western world is, is gaining, uh, in, in fact, losing, uh, losing weight. Uh, much of the growth is happening outside or beyond uh, this area. This is the so-called Easternization, as we know. Uh, the <coughs> Uh, the uh, Atlantic uh, area is, uh, of course, uh, progressively uh, going back. Uh, and, of course, uh, the uh, Indian Pacific strategic region is coming forward. Now, all that is, is very well known. Uh, this is the so-called phenomenon of the relative contraction of, uh, of the Western world, or let's call it transatlantic uh, uh, alliance or relationship. Uh, there is a rule in physics. It's very simple. If a substance uh, loses in size, uh, it should gain in density. Now, if, uh, for instance, the transatlantic uh, uh, world is losing in size, uh, it should, of course, compensate for that loss uh, by increasing density. Density is cohesion. Is it happening? No. It's just the opposite which is happening. That is, I believe, uh, is the challenge or the uh, problem uh, number one. Now, of course, 
why this is happening, it's not easy to explain. Because, in fact, um, if we come back to the transatlantic alliance, which is ultimately our subject, we have to ask the question, uh, do we still have a common flag, the transatlantic partnership? Yes, sir, we have. We have NATO. This is our flag. No problem. Really? So, uh, of course, as far as NATO is concerned, uh, we always have two basic questions. Uh, and if those questions are answered, then fine. Question number one, do we still have the unconditional uh, concept of collective defense as enshrined in Article 5 of the Washington Treaty? Or is it contingent upon some other factors like, uh, like uh, defense expenditure or contribution to the burdens and so on and so on? That is, of course, a basic question. That's what most people, at least uh, on this part of uh, the uh, uh, alliance or on this side of the Atlantic, uh, people ask. Another question, of course, which uh, rather the European side should answer uh, in a more uh, explicit and more clear way, uh, this is what does strategic autonomy of Europe mean? Uh, different answers. Does it mean that uh, <clears throat> Europe uh, have to uh, take more burden there should be a rebalancing of, uh, of, uh, of the burden, of the capabilities, of the responsibilities. Uh, that's uh, one answer. I mean, one question. If this is the question, the answer is very simple, yes, of course. Now, the second question is, does it mean that uh, uh, Europe should develop a, a, a stronger uh, foreign security and defense policy? Yes. The answer is yes, of course. Uh, next question, uh, does Europe need the uh, European Union uh, to develop its own army? Many people in Europe uh, say yes. It was, in fact, the first person who uh, uh, clearly uh, sent his message two or three years ago that we do need a common army was the Hungarian prime minister. Now, apparently, uh, there is a debate uh, emerging around this uh, uh, question. The real issue is, of course, what do we mean by that? Uh, we do have, uh, we do need defense capabilities, no doubt. Uh, but, of course, uh, first we should develop a stronger foreign policy and also a security policy. And, of course, defense policy is a kind of uh, uh, consequence uh, of the strengthening of uh, these uh, policies. But, indeed, indeed, I believe, yes, we do need, sooner or later, a much close cooperation in defense matters. And, of course, we have to, and that's the more thorny issue, we have to develop a, a functioning a relationship, a very good relationship, a cooperation with NATO. Of course, uh, there'll be a new player here, a European NATO member, but not EU member, a nuclear power, which is United Kingdom. So the situation is, of course, uh, uh, changing. Next question, of course, do we need to have a, a, a nuclear component of, uh, of this uh, new uh, uh, European uh, defense? Many people say that in the present world, if you want to have a military might or a military power, uh, it's impossible without having a nuclear component. And that's, of course, another debate which we perhaps don't have to decide now. But all in all, I don't want to get too much in these security issues uh, uh, because we have a perfect expert on that speaking immediately uh, after me. Uh, and the other reason that I would turn now to, uh, to, uh, to the next uh, uh, subject, uh, uh, which is trade, that... Uh, <coughs> That's the world uh, where I'm coming from, and I spent uh, much of my last 50 years in, 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 in the world of, uh, of trade in whatever form. So, do we have common interests in trade, in the transatlantic 
alliance or partnership. Just opening a bracket uh, in, in the G20, India, uh, Russia uh, had a meeting, India, uh, India Russia, and uh, China. And uh, interesting to be noted. And they said they want to de establish a partnership. They don't want to have an alliance, but they definitely want to have a partnership, which is a permanent consultation and cooperation in all possible areas. Uh, so watch out. But uh, <clears throat> do we have really common trade interests? That is, of course, uh, a very uh, serious question. We have always had competition, which is fine, which is very good. We always had very strong cooperation, uh, again, fine. But uh, at the same time, uh, at this point of time, it seems to be that uh, some question marks are lingering around. And uh, what is going to happen in the upcoming months weeks rather, or months or years, uh, may have a very, very serious impact upon this kind of uh, uh, trade and economic uh, solidarity between the two sides of the Atlantic, uh, which uh, has, I would underline, always been there, even if uh, some people uh, question it. But I have some doubts for the future. Now, as far as the present uh, trade policy of the United States is concerned, I would say there are two uh, theories. One theory is the, I would say, the Cold War theory with China. There is a trade war going on, we all know it, with China, between the two giants. And uh, some people say this is no longer a classic trade war, it is getting into a cold war and an across the border strategic rivalry or confrontation between the two countries, the two giants. And uh, of course, uh, it has its uh, reflection uh, in trade policy, introduction of tariffs and so on. Although, although now we have a truce. Interesting, did you notice that the word we now use in trade policy matters. When, for instance, Jean-Claude Juncker goes to Washington, tough cookie, by the way, uh, if you understand the meaning, this is from the US president, uh, which was a recognition, by the way. So uh, there was a truce between European Union and US. Now there is another truce, truce. It's a military war, just truce, not peace, Truce. Truce for 90 days between China and the uh, uh, and, uh, uh, United States. We'll see what is going to happen, again, it's not my words, uh, in the upcoming uh, 90 uh, uh, days. So, uh, but one uh, theory, as I said, is that uh, trade policy, traditional trade policy devices, instruments like tariffs, they have to be used uh, for a geopolitical purpose, for a geopolitical uh, objective, and this is the slowing down or stopping uh, the rise of China. I understand that. By the way, trade policy measures vis-a-vis -vis China bite, because China is a heavily export-driven economy, and they are really hurt uh, by the uh, trade restrictions, which have already been uh, introduced and which may be introduced in the future. So uh, uh, the theory has a good basis. Uh, in the long term, I don't know how much will be the inflicted damage, the self-inflicted damage to the US economy. That's of course an open question, but I don't want to get into that. It seems to be at this point of time that this kind of uh, uh, slowing down, stopping China uh, to become the, uh, the G1, uh, is now uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, main theories. Uh, but this is just one way of explaining things. The other way is that, uh, that um, uh, no, 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 it's, it's not about that. 
uh, United States has a serious trade deficit, by the way, with everyone, with everyone, including my country, United States has a serious, quote unquote, trade deficit with Hungary. So it's not just Germany, it's not just Japan, it's not just China, it's not all the others. So there should be, or there could be perhaps a basic macroeconomic reason behind, but don't get into that, I'm not an economic uh, uh, theorist. Uh, what we see is that, yes, definitely, uh, definitely, something should be done about uh, that. Uh, whether this is justified by economic theory or not, that's another question. But in any case, here the basic reason is domestic politics. Jobs must be created, jobs must be brought back, and that, I would say, something which we have to accept and recognize. So, uh, what is the main reason behind uh, the present uh, uh, trade uh, uh, restrictions uh, adopted by the uh, United States? It's number one, it is the uh, Chinese Cold War, or is it uh, uh, basically an economic uh, domestic, uh, economic, and political uh, reason. Uh, I don't know. But we will have a test. We'll have a test very soon. And the test will be uh, what will happen in the two truces. Uh, is the United States uh, going to introduce uh, tariffs on uh, European cars? Uh, if it does, I th think that basically the second theory would prevail or would uh, have the focus on the mind of the decision makers in Washington because in that case clearly uh, China is not that much relevant. Europe is a real problem and I just would like to underline that this is not the German cars. This is the economy of Slovakia. This is the economy of Hungary. This is the economy of many other countries. Slovakia and Hungary would be probably more negatively impacted by the car tariffs introduced by the United States than Germany itself. You know why. So uh, it is serious. And uh, uh, the introduction of car tariffs uh, will bring, of course, a clear demonstration that we don't need that much allies. If the Chinese theory would be number one, the first thing the United States should do is to strengthen alliances, find friends. Because the United States have the most friends in the world, still. And we should rely then as an American, we should rely upon friends. And this is our huge asset. This is our huge advantage over the Chinese, because the Chinese are coming up, that's true. Not just demography, I mean technology and, uh, and artificial intelligence and so on and so on. We all know that. And they are coming. And uh, the growth rate even slowing down, it's still more than the double of ours. So we would need friends. We would need a framework. But, of course, if we introduce car tariffs, uh, against our best friend and ally in the transatlantic alliance, which is an alliance uh, hurting the transatlantic link, indeed transatlantic bond, which was my favorite expression. Of course, uh, uh, that, 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 that could be an issue. Now, well, what, what, what should be the uh, EU reaction to that? What, what should we do? Well, uh, we would be extremely unhappy about a trade war between United States and China. Uh, some people say that we might be the smiling third. Nonsense. Nonsense. We would be severely and negatively impacted because the overall global economy would be very seriously and negatively impacted. We don't want it. We don't want to uh, uh, have a, a, a trade war, even less so cold war, uh, between China and the United States. Do we want to have a strong, uh, let's say, uh, 
alliance or special partnership between China and the United States? I don't think so. But you probably know this, uh, this old African tale. Uh, what the small animals uh, should be watchful about and uh, try to find some peaceful place uh, in two cases. First, when the elephants are fighting with each other, when the elephants make war. Yes, clear. Everybody escapes. But what should they do? I mean, in the other case, uh, when the uh, Elephants make love. Same story. So we are not a small animal, I'm not saying, because European Union is not a small animal. European Union is a big animal. But European Union has no thieves. So uh, we cannot defend ourselves. I mean, even economy, of course, uh, economically, we may have uh, some problems. And, and that's why I think that what we should do in this case, how shall we react to that, is that uh, we are very much interested in, in a more predictable, safer, uh, let's say, situation. Uh, we really would like uh, to make those truces, transform those truces uh, into uh, pieces, uh, because uh, I think that's, a, that's a, a, a universal interest. Of course, many, many, many things we'll have to uh, be done for that. I mean, uh, we definitely have to reform the multilateral trading system, which is the WTO. We all know that. Ideas are now there. They are on the paper. There is also an uh, emerging consensus on that. Of course, uh, uh, here, uh, United States, uh, European Union, and Japan uh, could play, should play, in fact, uh, a leading role. They are trying to, but uh, to what extent, that's another question. So uh, uh, a lot of things have to be uh, done, but uh, this is still not Europe's basic uh, uh, contribution. Uh, I think Europe's basic uh, contribution is that, uh, that we are very much interested in a rules-based uh, international order. Some people always say uh, rules-based uh, uh, liberal international order. I don't know why liberal. I could even say conservative, because it's based upon values and principles and rules. So for me, it's just a rules-based international order, which worked quite well. But it has to be adapted to the new realities. It has to be adapted to, uh, to disappointments. For instance, as far as the promises of China is concerned, which China made in the year 2001 when they joined the WTO. China is still a somewhat alien body in this multilateral system. So let's change it. Let's develop new rules and let's kind of contribute to this, let's say, overall restructuring of uh, the multilateral uh, world uh, trading system. But of course, this is a very complex subject. I have no time to go into that. Maybe uh, just, uh, just the, <clears throat> the final question, uh, which is perhaps uh, the heart of the transatlantic uh, alliance, because we uh, tried to discuss very briefly the flag, very briefly also uh, the trade, but, uh, of course, here comes the, uh, the, uh, the third question. Uh, do, we, do we still have a common Bible? Do we uh, really have the same world vision? Uh, do, we, uh, do we have uh, the basic uh, values and principles and norms? Do we still want to respect norms, which is the heart of European identity. It goes back to Roman law and Christianity, which was taken over by the United States. This is the Atlantic Alliance. So do we still have it? Do we still have the same meaning uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the Bible in a more symbolic sense? That is, of course, a big question. 
I think we Europeans, we have to stick to our own identity, which is very much rooted in norms. Whether these are moral norms or legal norms, it's basically the same. So that should be, I believe, our contribution. And I think that is the issue upon which the future of the transatlantic alliance will be uh, uh, decided. I'm optimistic, by the way. So uh, competition is fine. It'll still be there. We need it. But at the same time, we have to recover. We have to find, again, the commonalities uh, which made, after all, the transatlantic alliance uh, what it was. But we can't really preach. It's not enough. How transatlantic alliance was established? Why? It was based upon basic, reasonable interests. United States entered World War I and World War II. Uh, well, there was, of course, a moralistic uh, background, no doubt. But basically, it was in the interest of the United States. And the United States joined, entered the war because they recognized they had to do it. Uh, so uh, what I would like to refer to now is that uh, it's not just the Bible. It's not just the values. It's not just the culture. Uh, it's not just soft power, where we are still the, the most powerful in the world. But it is also underlying basic geopolitical security, security and economic interests. And just to recall my contraction theory, that uh, unless we strengthen and increase cohesion, then we will lose not only in size, but we will only also lose in density, that is, we will lose in cohesion. And that's what I believe should be avoided. I thank you for your attention.